Euh, Permettez-moi, avant de commencer avec le même informel, de euh, vous souhaiter tous euh, la bienvenue à la mission permanente du Canada au PMC. We thank you all very much for uh, trudging through a very, very Canadian uh, morning <laughs> to come and join us uh, in what we think is going to be an exceptional event today, uh, looking at the whole area of power sharing and the challenges in, in co socio societal political settlements. And um, we're very <coughs> grateful uh, for our panelists uh, who I think bring an enormous amount of practical and, uh, and academic expertise to this issue. And we're delighted to host this event with uh, the United Nations University, the Department of Political Affairs of the UN, and NYU's Center for Constitutional Transitions. And while UNU is not a member of the panel per se, they have played a central role in shaping the, the event today and organizing the discussion. We're very grateful to you, James, and your colleagues. That was, you know, I think the rationale for us wanting to support this event is that the nature of the world in which we are living is one of almost permanent transition in every corner of the planet. We've seen this uh, not just in the Arab Spring, but some would suggest even as far back as, uh, as the 1990s, uh, from the fall of the, the Berlin Wall. And what we're seeing is all over the world countries seeking to rebuild their political systems or to undertake significant constitutional reforms and these are incredibly complex issues in diverse societies where we're seeing the unmaking of an old order and the appearance of new fault lines or perhaps old ones that have reappeared along ethnic, religious, cultural, economic, and linguistic divides. And th these are very, very difficult political issues. They're obviously very, very difficult societal issues. And when you look at situations at play in places such as Egypt or Libya or Syria, uh, now in Qatar and Mali and places uh, like South Sudan, uh, it's uh, it's sobering indeed to see the scope of the challenge, and it's uh, also lamentable how often these situations descend into violence uh, that is very very difficult to turn around. And uh, I think there is a compelling need uh, for many uh, for many of us to look at how we might be able to provide assistance two states that are seeking to manage their internal diversity in a peaceful manner, because the consequences of not doing that, I think, are, are singularly unacceptable. And how we create the kinds of arrangements necessary to be able to underpin stability uh, through group recognition, through power sharing, through the establishment of effective democratic institutions is really at the core uh, of what uh, today's event and today's discussion is, uh, is going to take on. And as I said earlier, they're not easy issues. Uh, the eruptions that we've seen you know, around social cleavages it mean that political settlements need to be inter intertwined with the questions of reconciliation, with justice, with peace building, uh, to bring a lasting set of political arrangements that can pr provide the security and the basis for societies uh, to move forward. And there are really no ready-made answers to these issues. And I think our experts today will try to give us a, a, a basis for at least considering these issues going forward. And our reason for wanting to collaborate in this project is that these are issues that in Canada we're, we're confronting every day. <coughs> and uh, as a society that is more and more pluralist in character, which has a long history of mediating relations not only between our three founding nations, but also embracing the diverse communities that have come to Canada and our official commitment to multiculturalism as a society, I think speak to a, a deeply held belief in Canada that the promotion of human rights, human dignity, freedom of religion and belief are absolutely central to our ability to construct political and societal arrangements that, that can underpin stability in our society. And in the foreign policy domain, uh, this has put us in a situation of, uh, of standing loudly in many instances to oppose all forms of oppression and discrimination. And the latest manifestation of this perhaps uh, from the current government that we've seen is with the establishment of the Office of Religious Freedom. But it goes much beyond that into our overall policies and programming that we undertake uh, both in political and in the developmental world. So I'm very hopeful that the conversation uh, that you will undertake today uh, will contribute 
to a greater understanding of not only the issues, but the experiences, the potential solutions, uh, and the lessons learned from these processes, so that we can perhaps help move away from the zero-sum nature of, these, of, of this reality of, of, of having to reestablish or reaffirm uh, political uh, and societal underpinnings going forward. I mentioned that uh, DPA uh, is a, an important partner in this exercise, and I'm very pleased to be able to invite to the podium now Jason Gluck, who is the constitutional focal point of DPA, who will also provide some introductory remarks. So Jason, please, the floor. Thank you, Ambassador, and thank you to the Canadian Mission for hosting us here this morning. Um, I'm charged within a very short amount of time trying to frame this morning's discussion and perhaps offer up some questions that uh, to challenge our panelists as they uh, <coughs> hear from their experience and expertise on the issues. Uh, managing power sharing and dealing with challenges to associational political settlements is our topic. And I think the applied assumption today is that there are that consociational power sharing arrangements are sometimes necessary and appropriate mechanisms to resolve violent conflict. And yet, to the extent they legalize allocations of government positions based on communal identity, they may violate international human rights guarantees of equality and prohibitions against discrimination. That Bosnia Herzegovina's consociational rules regarding eligibility to run for president amounted to ethnic discrimination. Uh, one of our panels, panelist uh, Chris, I know you've written extensively on this, so I hope to hear more on this case and how it, uh, and its implications for these arrangements uh, going forward. Now, at the risk of stating the obvious, consociational arrangements have been instrumental in resolving violent conflict and putting dis divided societies on the path towards peaceful coexistence. Lebanon, Northern Ireland, and Bosnia-Herzegovina are, are examples. Furthermore, these arrangements have limited uh, the, uh, the opportunity of certain individuals, including and especially minorities, to compete, compete for certain state privileges. Given this, we might hope and expect today's discussion to focus on a debate between the lesser of two evils. Are we willing to put aside certain fundamental rights in order to resolve violent conflict? Or are we bound to uphold certain international norms, whatever the circumstances? At the same time, we might expect disagreement on even how to frame the question itself. Is it a tension between consociational arrangements and human rights? Or does it, is it a question of competing rights? That of individuals versus communities? Or between individuals and the nation as a whole? In, a, in addition to weighing and debating these first order questions, I hope the panel today will explore some underlying assumptions. Do consociational arrangements in fact provide for sustainable, peaceful coexistence? Or, do they further entrench societal with divisions along <coughs> ethnic, religious, or linguistic lines, even as they contribute to end the end of violent conflict? Put another way, are they contributing to peace building, or are they merely creating a negative peace? Now, ending violent conflict is no small thing. In fact, in many of the case studies I expect us to explore today, it may have been the thing. But it is at least worth asking if even in some of those cases, were consociational arrangements the best mechanism for achieving this? To put it in constitutional terms, do these arrangements achieve le legitimate state interests in the most proportional or least restrictive means available? And if not, what alternatives exist? Similar inquiries can be made with regard to equality and anti-discrimination norms, neither of which is absolute in any state. Might we consider consociational arrangements in a similar vein as positive discrimination, which is constitutionally permissible in many countries? But what about a temporal limitation? Can consociational arrangements for a limited time period advance the interest of ending violent conflict without unduly limiting rights? This was a question perhaps at the heart of the European Court of Human Rights decision with regard to Bosnia and Slovenia. One thing is clear. The issue of consociation and human rights is very much a live issue, unsettled among academics, jurists, mediators, and policymakers. For this reason, as one of the bodies of the United Nations often at the forefront of promoting peaceful political solutions to conflict, the Department of Political Affairs is particularly interested in the exploration of these questions and challenges, and it's why I'm extremely grateful to the Canadian Mission, the United Nations University, and the Center for Constitutional Transitions at NYU Law School as well as our esteemed panelists 
for joining DPA and exploring these and other questions today. Thank you, and now I'll pass things on to our moderator, Professor Sujit Chowdhury. Thank you so much for welcoming us and hosting us today at the mission. Um, we're absolutely delighted to be partnering with the United Nations University, uh, with the Department of Political Affairs, uh, with the Canadian Mission to the United Nations, um, on this on this event, uh, which is uh, raised an, uh, the, the motivation for the for the for the panel uh, is that the conflict between power sharing and consociational arrangements in post conflict constitutional contexts and um, regional and international human rights norms is a pervasive problem uh, in the world of peace building and conflict resolution, and uh, it's almost a problem in which uh, different parts of the international order and different sets of institutions governed by different sets of norms uh, become engaged uh, in the same sets of conflicts, um, perhaps one after the other, sometimes simultaneously, and, they're, they're, and, and what has not been yet worked through is the ways in which these different institutions and actors and norms interact. Uh, and, and the failure to give thought to how they interact and how the relationship ought to be managed uh, can create downstream uh, complications that might undermine both the objectives of, 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 of peace building and also of respect for human rights. And so, uh, and so, so, the, so the issue could not be more important or more timely. And, uh, and, and so what, what we wanted to do with the Center for Constitutional Transitions was to bring together um, leading experts who are both um, academics uh, and, and senior practitioners who've worked on these issues on the ground uh, to begin a, a dialogue and a discussion <coughs> with their colleagues in the foreign policy community and at the United Nations about what the issues are and the ways in which we might sort through the, the different ways in which we can, we can articulate the relationship between uh, these two um, agendas. And so we could not have a more uh, distinguished uh, panel uh, to address these issues. And so I'll begin uh, with my um, left and, and move over to my, to my right. To my left is uh, George Anderson, uh, who is a senior fellow at the Center for Constitutional Transitions uh, this year. Um, he spent 30 years as a, as a, as a civil servant in the Canadian government, um, serving at, for many years as deputy minister in a number of ministries. Following his service with the Canadian government, he was the uh, chief executive officer and president of the former federations, an international network of federal states, uh, and in that capacity and in subsequent work has worked in over 25 countries on questions of federalism uh, in particular. Uh, he uh, spent the 2012-2013 years a member of the UI, UN standby team uh, in, the, in the mediation uh, support unit, uh, and he is uh, subsequently being attached to the Yemeni uh, process where he's advising uh, Jamal Benamar, the SRSG, uh, and so he's uh, been very engaged with these issues and we're delighted to have him here. Um, to my right is, uh, is Chris McCrudden, uh, who is also uh, a visiting fellow at the NYU Center for Constitutional Transitions, uh, and he is a professor of human rights and equality law at Queen's University, Belfast, and he also holds um, a parallel appointment uh, as the Cook Professor at the University of Michigan Law School. Uh, he, he was for many years a professor at, at Oxford, um, and uh, he is a leading expert on international human rights law, on uh, trade law, and, and, and most relevant uh, to this uh, work um, is the author of a book that I, I, I must recommend to all of you, uh, under, um, Courts and Consociations, Human Rights versus Power Share, uh, which is very much motivated by his experiences uh, and work in Northern Ireland um, in connection with the Good Friday Agreement, but is a very much a detailed um, case study and example of what's happened in Bosnia. Uh, with the European Court of Human Rights and the Village of Laws, and so we're delighted that Chris is here. And then, to Chris's right is uh, is is my colleague uh, Mehdi Joel Zahar, uh, who is a professor of political science and is research director of the Research Network on Peace Operations, and is also a fellow at the Center for International Research and Studies at the University of Montreal. And she's currently uh, on leave from UDM, uh, where she is now uh, about serving as a as a senior expert on power sharing, also with the UN standby team at MSU, and she has agreed to extend uh, her time uh, at MSU for another year. And so, uh, and she is, uh, she is an expert on militia politics, transition violence, power sharing, and she has a strong uh, regional experience and expertise in the Middle East. And, I, and she won't mind me saying she's Lebanese by, by background, so these issues have a certain personal salience for her. Uh, and 
I, I, I'd be remiss if I didn't note that there's a heavy Canadian component um, to the whole event, because uh, there's th uh, three of us on the panel who are Canadian, and Arbor is quite close to the border. So, um, <laughs> so uh, we're very delighted that, that Canada is hosting this. And so our, our format t for today will be this, that, we, that each of our panelists has agreed um, to speak for up to 10 minutes to offer some initial thoughts on the themes and in response to some of the points that Jason has raised. Uh, and then uh, what we'd like to do is move into uh, a Q&A discussion session uh, with, um, with the excellencies and, and other members who, who have come uh, to have a dialogue about these issues. And, and, that, and that second part of the proceeding uh, will be subject to Chatham House rules. Uh, so uh, it's not for attribution, uh, but the first part of the proceedings are on the record. So, uh, so what we'll do is uh, we'll begin with uh, Chris McCrum. So thank you. Um, uh, question and answer discussion session. And so what I would, what I would propose is that um, we take some comments and questions into the Canadian, the Canadian mission uh, to UNU, to DPA, and to the Centre for Constitutional Transitions for setting up a discussion. And thanks particularly to Jason for setting the scene in such a, a, a stimulating way. And it's uh, many of the issues that he wants to raise um, that I'm, I'm planning to at least address in a sketchy way in the 10 minutes that I've been given, and I thought perhaps we could begin, uh, given his challenge, uh, with the uh, case that he mentioned in Bosnia-Herzegovina, um, because I think it provides a, an interesting case study in many of the issues that uh, we want to raise. Uh, and essentially it raises the question about the role of human rights standards in post-conflict societies, um, in, and particularly those in which there's a consociation on political settlement, and particularly the role of courts. Um, in uh, in that mix. So so what were they? What, were the, what was the case? Some of you will be familiar with it. Some of you won't. So I think it might be useful just to um, sketch out the details <coughs> so that we're all on the same page. So uh, two individuals, um, Dervo Sedic and Jakob Finci, um, are both citizens of Bosnia Herzegovina, and they describe themselves as of Roma and Jewish origin, respectively. Uh, and in the summer of 2006, um, Sedic and Finci. Um, separately challenged the Bosnian constitutional provisions that provide that only persons declaring affiliation with one of three constituent peoples in Bosnia are entitled to stand for certain elected posts. Um, they were a member of the others uh, who were not constituent peoples. Um, so in the preamble to the constitution, only Bosniaks, <coughs> Croats and Serbs are described as constituent peoples. The Constitution makes a distinction between, as I've said, constituent peoples and others, and others would include other uh, minorities such as Roma and Jews, uh, Montenegrins, Blacks, and those of mixed marriages, and those who don't choose to self-identify with any of the constituent peoples. So these constitutional arrangements were established for Bosnia under the Dayton Peace Agreement of 1995. Since neither Sedic nor Finci declared an affiliation with any of the constituent peoples, they were ineligible to stand for election to the presidency, which is a three-person collective head of state, and to the House of Peoples, which is the second uh, stage, second chamber of the state parliament, uh, sort of effectively the federal senate of, uh, of Bosnia. They complained to the European Court of Human Rights that their ineligibility to stand for election was because of their Roma and Jewish origin, precisely the issue that you're raising. So in its judgment in December 2009, the Grand Chamber of the European Court um, concluded by 14 votes to 3 that the applicant's ineligibility to stand for election to the state's House of Peoples um, was because of their ethnic identity and that it lacked an objective and reasonable justification. Again, precisely the issue that Jason raised. Bosnia had therefore breached the prohibition of discrimination and the conduct of elections under the European Convention on Human Rights. Furthermore, the constitutional provisions under which the applicants were ineligible for election to the state presidency was also held to constitute ethnic discrimination more broadly under the relatively recent prohibition against discrimination in Protocol No. 12 which is an additional anti-discrimination provision that was introduced into the convention uh, relatively recently. So it too was said to lack an objective and reasonable justification. So accordingly, the court concluded, again by 16 votes to 1, that there had been a violation of the convention. Here's a key point. To date, the decision remains unimplemented. 
despite considerable pressure from the Council of Europe and the EU in particular. And my understanding is that the EU is uh, heading towards, if not actually specified, that compliance with the court judgment is a condition for membership of the Union. So although the term is never used in the judgment of the court, which preferred the expression power sharing, the arrangements that were challenged and found to be in breach of the convention are classic components of what are now called consociations. So even more precisely, the Bosnian arrangements are components of what uh, might be called corporate consociations. So bear with me for a moment. I want to distinguish between corporate consociations and liberal consociations. By a corporate consociation, I mean a consociation that accommodates groups according to ascriptive criteria like ethnicity, um, and rest on the assumption that uh, group identities are fixed and that groups are internally homogenous. That's in contrast to a liberal consociation which rewards whichever political identities emerge in democratic elections, whether they're based on ethnic groups or identities that bridge ethnic groups. As I say, in these terms, Bosnia is a corporate consociation and therefore, in a sense, the most difficult to justify under liberal uh, human rights standards. So understanding the Sedic and Finci case and its consequences is, I agree with Jason, I think of critical importance for an appreciation of the future relationship between courts and consociations in Europe, certainly, but also international human rights law, given the apex role that the European Court of Human Rights plays in the international system more generally. The case raises directly and dramatically the role of courts in balancing the desire to end bloody ethnic conflicts with the need to establish an acceptable degree of human rights protections in the longer term in profoundly divided places that have adopted these consociation arrangements. Now, I realize that this is not the only challenge facing consociational states, clearly not, but I think it's a new and pressing challenge. <coughs> so, um, Brendan O'Leary and I, um, as, as Sujit has said, recently published a, a book um, called Courts and Consociations, and in that we consider the use of these consociational arrangements to manage these kinds of disputes and their compatibility with human rights norms uh, under the ECHR, but not exclusively. And we argue, and this again is maybe the second crucial point, that the recent decision in Sedic and Finci has significantly altered the approach that it previously took to judicial review of consociational arrangements in other consociations, particularly the, the Belgian consociational arrangements. So that they take a different approach between the Belgian and the Bosnian. And we also argue that the approach that the court took was unfortunate. <clears throat> so the court's decision is ambiguous and can be given either a broader or a narrower interpretation, the former being more skeptical of consociations than the latter. If the, bro if the broader interpretation subsequently proves to be the correct interpretation and indicates the likely trajectory of this and other human rights courts' reactions to consociations, we suggested that they may have several problematic consequences. So I'm, this is my second point addressing Jason's question of consequences. So I'll mention what we regard as the central problems. There are more that we detail in the book, but we think of these as the central problems. Legal and political advisors are likely to recommend to the makers of future power sharing arrangements with consociational components to exclude bills of rights with wide application and seek to exclude regional courts and the jurisprudence of international human rights law. Future international or cosmopolitan courts that follow in the path of the European Court of Human Rights may also suffer themselves from reduced legitimacy as a result of the political rejection of their judgments. And future diplomats, begging your presence, delegates and peace negotiators in other places riven by bloody ethnic conflicts will have considerably less flexibility in reaching either a transitional or a durable political settlement and this may unintentionally contribute to prolonging such conflicts. So the argument developed uh, in the book forms no part of a polemic against human rights norms, or international courts, or international law. We have no wish to add to the many screeds uh, in this vein that often, I have to say, have a xenophobic provenance. We've both promoted ourselves human rights provisions in constitutional advisory work um, in sites of past conflict. We frequently agree with human rights advocates in seeking to remedy provisions in these constitutions, laws, or policies that appear to be exclusionary or uh, racist. 
So neither of us should be misread as opponents of human rights. We're not, however, human rights absolutists. So we consider that where rights clash, some rights may be more important than others. Rights, moreover, should not always trump other claims of policy. One of these is a set of political arrangements known as consociations. So we suggested, and here I'll now end, um, that in order to avoid these unfortunate consequences <coughs> that may flow from the decision, if it's interpreted in this broad way, then there are ways of avoiding that. And here are suggestions for an alternative approach to the European Court of Human Rights. First, the historical and political contexts in which these, pro these provisions are drafted, especially peace agreements, um, deserve to be pro properly understood, particularly by courts. <coughs> Apparently repugnant provisions may have defensible political origins. Some provisions in constitutions that may appear racist in character may not be exactly what they seem to impatient minds. They deserve more care in their interpretation. Second, in evaluating constitutions or organic laws, courts need to carefully consider whether these laws have a democratic character. Where they're made in a generally inclusive manner, where all of the affected peoples, in some reasonable sense, are free to be represented in negotiations and deliberations, where they are ratified by democratic means, then they deserve greater respect from courts than those that were not. Interestingly, Bosnia was not. But the court does not make its point to find Bosnia in violation because of this absence of a democratic character. It could have taken a much narrower approach. So in particular, perhaps, associations in states or regions that have been ratified through referendums, and I think particularly of Northern Ireland, especially with the current concurrent dissent of the affected groups, deserve a higher degree of respect than those who do not. Third, even where the constitution or statute appears to conflict with valued human rights, prudent courts are well advised, I think, to treat such subjects as within the legitimate discretion allowed to a sovereign democratic republic. A careful and systematic investigation of the constitutions and organic laws, I think, would turn up, in many circumstances, many apparent archaic anomalies or rank injustices in many settled democracies. I think only, for example, um, I'm being provocative here, of the arrangements that qualify uh, who can stand as president of the United States. Uh, would they qualify under current human rights norms? When such criticisms are valid, however, the key question is not are these arrangements really an international court? We have argued that the majority of the European Court of Human Rights' latest answers to these questions are troubling and its reasoning is unpersuasive. The judges of Europe's most distinguished human rights institution may unintentionally but imprudently have cast doubt on forms of political practice with a strong track record of helping to terminate violent conflicts. Thank you, Chris. And address how we get there in the first place. So what I'd like to do in my 10 minutes, and I'm going to try and stick to 10 minutes, uh, because I'd like to hear from you, is <coughs> sketch very briefly the causes uh, of the tension between power sharing and human rights, uh, the consequences of power sharing agreements, and uh, maybe suggest preliminary thoughts about trying to mitigate those tensions before we get to the courts. So in terms of the causes of tensions, um, I think that the first thing we've got to ask ourselves is really how we frame conflicts. And this is not to deny the role of ethnicity, but maybe to ask uh, the question of what function ethnicity performs in conflicts. Um, political scientists have written volumes about what they call ethnic entrepreneurship, which is basically the decision by political leaders pursuing objectives to mobilize communities on the basis of ethnicity. As I think Chris described very uh, elegantly, ascriptive identities are easy to mobilize. And in a sense, 
it becomes easier for leaders, and I'm thinking here of Bosnia, where I've also spent a big part of my academic career, like Slobodan Milosevic, to legitimate their policies based on an ethnic reading of the history. But of course, everyone who's worked on Bosnia knows that the reasons for the conflict were not simply ethnic. And that in a sense, reading the conflict from the moment at which the leaders sat to negotiate Dayton made abstraction of the decade which led to the conflict in the first place. And therefore, it becomes important to, our, to ask ourselves whether by identifying conflicts as ethnic, we are not, in fact, uh, looking at the tip of the iceberg and contributing as mediators, as an international community, to the problem of the tension between power sharing and human rights. I'm particularly thinking of this with what is currently happening in South Sudan in the background. In South Sudan today, if you read the news, and most of the people in this room do that religiously, uh, we're told that there's a conflict raging between the Dinka and the Nuer tribes. And that the leaders of these tribes, the current president, Salva Kiir, and his former vice president, Riyad Mashar, are in fact simply fighting for their community's rights. Well, in fact, anyone who's worked in South Sudan, and I've had the opportunity and the privilege to work in South Sudan, thanks to George when he was president of the Forum of Federations, knows that the problem is not ethnic. And that, in fact, the same problem that exists today between uh, Salva Kiir and Riyad Mashar exists as well between Salva Kiir and a number of other contenders for power. And that communities are being mobilized on an ethnic basis. But it's a problem of governance which will not be solved if we decide uh, to mediate an agreement between those two and get them to share power with some people from their tribes as their acolytes and uh, someone is, sub I'm sometimes tempted to say accomplices. So the first thing I think, the first point is to really stress what Chris has said in his closing remarks about context. It is important to understand the context, not simply when you are in the tribunals trying to sort out the tension, but also when you are at the negotiating table as an outside mediator trying to actually uh, find a solution to put an end to conflicts. That will be my first point. My second point is about what happens at that table in terms of the selection of interlocutors. And so it follows from the first. I think that um, we do not ask ourselves the tough questions. And of course, there are good reasons why that is not the case. There's time pressures. There's often humanitarian disasters, as what is currently happening in Syria, that force us to make quick decisions. But these quick decisions tend to be systematically believing that the communities are homogeneous, when in fact, uh, any engagement in these countries, whether Bosnia, my country of origin, Lebanon, uh, Syria today, <coughs> Yemen, uh, shows you that ethnic communities are as riven internally as they are uh, divided against their, uh, the other communities in a country. Second, believing that the people with weapons speak for the entire communities and therefore privileging at the table the people with weapons. And again, here, I want to make the same point that I made about ethnicity. This is not about excluding uh, warlords. Warlords need to be at the table, and that might also hurt certain uh, international rights and civilities. But in a sense, if one wants to be pragmatic and end conflicts, you cannot end the conflicts without the people who are the primary actors of those conflicts. So the point is not to exclude uh, the main actors, it is to ask ourselves whether we cannot include others and whether by uh, identifying these actors as the only actors 
we're not actually a short-changing society. So who are we including, but more impl importantly, who are we excluding by identifying the main actors the way we do? And again here, I'd like to maybe point to a recent experience in Mali, where uh, the manner in which uh, the peace, well, the preliminary peace <laughs> agreement was framed, uh, identified the government on the one hand and uh, two Tuareg groups on the other hand as the main interlocutors. Uh, that did not acknowledge the fact that the government does not represent all of the South of Mali and that there are lots of people who actually have serious concerns with the way in which this government has been handling particularly relationships with rural areas but neither do the Tuaregs represent all the communities of the north. And so by identifying the, uh, the problem and the cross, uh, crux of the conflict as really a conflict between the government and the Tuaregs, and not framing it in a larger way, uh, the preliminary agreement actually sows uh, the seeds of its own failures. In other words, I'm here making a point which is related to my earlier point on ethnicity. <coughs> When you frame conflicts or when you frame peace settlements in ethnic terms, you're always bound to forget someone. And I had actually the Jews and the Roma in Bosnia as an example, but you can think of Christian minorities in Iraq as another example, of citizens who find themselves barred from some of um, the positions, the responsibilities, and the civic duties that they might want to uh, take on. And that becomes particularly problematic, not just in the Bosnians of this world where, you know, when I was working in Bosnia back in the late 1990s, <laughs> most people agreed that uh, Jacob Finzi was probably one of the most uh, credible candidates for the presidency and someone who could unite a lot of Bosnians. I know that since then things have changed, but at the time that was one of the uh, main points that we made time and again. But also in places like Mali or the Central African Republic or Yemen, where human resources are at a premium and where the people who are excluded might be the people that are needed to bring the countries to shore. My third point is about uh, the structuring and impact of power sharing. Institutions, political scientists will tell you, have a nasty habit of enduring in spite of our efforts to treat them. They are difficult to change, particularly when they are written into constitutions. And that is a tendency of recent peace settlements, to write whatever the political agreement is into the constitution. In a sense, that is totally understandable because of the level of mistrust between the protagonists. On the other hand, writing the division of power that was negotiated at Dayton into the Bosnian constitution locked the system. And locking the system does not only mean that ethnic identities become the most important identities, it also means that the actors who sign a peace agreement end up being the ones that are best positioned to continue to remain in power over the decades that follow. Why? Simply because the way in which you structure your institutions structures also who gets resources, who has voice, how you uh, incentivize behavior. And in other words, it makes it much more rewarding to play the ethnic game than not. And I think that the best proof is the difficulty in Bosnia, in spite of tremendous international support, financial, political, and otherwise, to really give substance to non-ethnic parties. In spite of the efforts, almost 20 years later, non-ethnic parties in Bosnia continue to be much weaker than the ethnic parties. And that is because the system is structured in such a way that the ethnic parties always have uh, an advantage. Uh, I will take Lebanon as another example of that. Um, in my country of origin, uh, 
we are soon at 150 years of various versions of consociational power sharing, which have basically given <coughs> religious sects and a few families that claim to represent these religious sects politically a hold over the politics. I think the feasibility issue is a very important one. And I wanted to say that, in fact, we both want to put the lid on conflict, and often, with our interventions, whether they are in mutability, than most of the settlements of the past decade have. And in that, uh, in that spirit, I want to make only a few suggestions as to how we could proceed. First of all, by broadening participation in the discussion around the contours of the future of a state. This does not only mean bringing in society. There's been a lot of talk about including women, including youth, particularly in relationship to the Arab Spring. Um, it also means not dealing with conflicts piecemeal. Often, each country has not one but multiple conflicts happening <coughs> in parallel. And the lessons of those places where con the conflicts have been dealt with piecemeal suggest that basically that creates uh, outbidding and makes it very difficult to steer away from the course of the first settlement. So for example, and I have uh, people in here who know much more about this than I do, but in Sudan, the decision to deal with a conflict between the South and Khartoum without really taking on board the fact that this conflict was the same as the conflict between Darfur and Khartoum, or the East and Khartoum, made it such that when the time came for the Darfuris to sit at the table, they wanted to have the same kind of deal as uh, the uh, SPLM did. In other words, the lessons of Sudan, I hope, will be born in, uh, in mind when we uh, actually address <laughs> South Sudan. Second of three things, sunset closes. Sunset clauses have been successfully used in certain places to uh, allow for power sharing to evolve and to broaden. Now, of course, I don't know enough about those places to really uh, suggest that this is the policy. However, I think that we can put it to the discussion whether or not sunset clauses can actually be useful. And third, most importantly from my own experience, and that is what I will conclude upon, the sequencing of political settlements, constitution writing. Too often, we tend to negotiate all of these things in abundance, and to negotiate the rules for the future at a time when people are only thinking about the past. Places where there has been more space between the political settlement and constitution writing tend to have, on average, less of a problem and less of a tension between power sharing and human rights. And that suggests that places that have muddled through the Libyas, the Nepals of this world, may not be a success from the perspective of foreigners who want a quick fix, who want to be able to move on to the next problem, but may ultimately, at the end of the day, have much more sustainable settlements, the kind that Jason will, in <coughs> fact, uh, provide for both consociation and also hopefully peace and more democratic systems. Okay. George. With whom I've had dealings in the past. Um, the, uh, we've, had, we've had two very thoughtful and uh, quite different presentations so far. Mine's going to be perhaps a little less thoughtful, but uh, uh, again, quite different. Um, in that I'm going to talk a little bit more about sort of the politics of associational arrangements as they compare with, with some others. Um, and, and part of that is that I'm not, my expertise to the extent I have any tends to be more on the federal side and I've not done that much in terms of uh, peace negotiations or work on consociationalism. Uh, but the, uh, before I get into uh, talking about the mechanisms, I just make a comment about uh, identity. It picks a bit up on what Marie Joel said, but uh, identity is, uh, ident is, is, is it's commonplace, but it's, it's worth repeating that identities are social contracts, the constructs, and they they change over time. They react <coughs> to political facts. Um, the mobilization can happen for a variety of reasons. Uh, 
and you can see countries where the people were mobilized in one way. The Netherlands is an interesting example where the country was mobilized around uh, religion politically, uh, but over time it worked its way, part because of secularization, uh, out of a consociational structure. It's one of the few cases where one can see actually the emergence from a consociational structure through normal politics. But in our, in, in our country, Canada, uh, I mean, French Canadian nationalism has been around well, since the 19th century, but it's had very different character over time and, and political implications of, of, of it has, has changed. And somebody worked on that issue a good deal when I was in government. I, I can tell you that, certainly it's my view, that it's, the type of nationalism we're dealing with in Quebec today is quite different from what we were dealing with in the 1970s. So even in a relatively short period, uh, you can see significant change. Now, my view on associations is neither to sort of praise them nor to bury them, uh, but I, 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 they're obviously very difficult arrangements. They're usually reached as a last uh, so possible solution. Uh, and uh, the question is whether they are inevitable in all of the cases or whether one could have, as uh, Marie and Joelle is suggesting, get, get, come up with something uh, a little bit more like normal politics. Uh, Chris, uh, uh, in the book that he did with Brendan O'Leary, uh, laid out for a four-part definition of consociations. Uh, the first had to do with uh, parity between uh, cross-communities uh, in terms of power sharing, where there's, the emphasis is on the joint making of public policy. Uh, secondly, and this is my order, not theirs, uh, explicit veto rights that may be granted to each community on vital issues. Uh, thirdly, functional autonomy within each group, so where you devolve certain powers uh, to them which can be fu strictly functional if, uh, or territorial. And finally, proportionality, which means the representation in shared institutions to a certain extent reflects the size of the populations. And that, he also says, might be extended to fiscal resources. Now, I, I thought what might be helpful just to sort of go through those four characteristics and ask to what extent we find them in other regimes. And, uh, so we're going to start with uh, functional autonomy. Uh, that, of course, is not particularly controversial. I mean, there are lots of regimes. I mean, this is the essence of federalism, which is that you devolve functional powers to territorial units. Uh, these units can be strictly territorial and have no particular quality in terms of the character of their population. But in many cases, they do have a, a particular identity. Uh, with, whether it's religious or, or linguistic or ethnic. Um, we, we actually have in Ontario, uh, Canada is a federal country, but in Ontario we actually have Catholic school boards, which is a, a case of functional devolution of, of that type. So you can, find them out, you can find that type of devolution outside of consociational arrangements. And I may say that the United Nations Human Rights Commission has found our school board arrangements in Ontario to be offside. Uh, there was a case brought before that you probably know about, uh, but it is interesting. So it's not just consociational arrangements of this type that can get challenged, but also uh, ones such as we had in Ontario. And Newfoundland had five school boards, but I was glad to be part of the constitutional, contribute modestly to the constitutional amendment that actually eliminated those five school, school boards. Uh, so functional autonomy can create practical problems, but it's not a particular characteristic that's limited to uh, or special to uh, consociationalism. Similarly, the issue of proportionality, uh, that's by no means limited to consociationalism. You find uh, many federal countries have features which bring that in, and not just federal countries, but where you get into issues of balancing representation in the civil service, the courts, the army, and what have you. Um, it, it, it can lead to tensions with the merit principle. And, you know, we've seen that. Uh, you could have, in, in federations, you could have a major debate about how far to go in terms of sharing federal resources. And many federal, so proportionality is, can be a characteristic of either federal or consociational regimes, but it doesn't necessarily get fully reflected. And in, in the case of Burundi, uh, where you have a very small minority, uh, you actually don't have much proportionality because the, the structure between the two, the two communities has been to favor the, the, the small community in a quite disproportionate way, particularly in terms of the structure of the army. Uh, 
but but the idea of, of, of making special arrangements to get representation uh, of, of of different communities within governmental institutions this is not this is not particularly striking um, the uh, the real distinctiveness of consociationalism lies in its other two elements, which is parity in decision making and explicit veto rights. Uh, these are contrary to simple majoritarian views regarding decision making. Now, again, that in itself is not extraordinary. There are many, many regimes put limits on uh, majority decision making, uh, either formally or informally. Uh, this is most striking in amendment formulas for constitutions. Uh, which often require special majorities, uh, or, and, and that can include the consent of some portion of territorial communities of the states or provinces in a federation. The, fed, the threshold can be very high, with very small populations having a veto on certain matters. I mean, hold your noses when I tell you that in Canada, the smallest province in the country has an absolute veto on whether we ever get rid of the monarchy. Uh, population of 120 to 30,000. So you can have some of these things written in. They're viewed as part of the social contract. But um, for the most part, they're not part of day-to-day -day politics. It, you don't amend constitutions all the time. And uh, depending on the degree of unanimity around the con or consensus around the constitution, uh, they may not create particular problems. Upper houses. In many federations, uh, give disproportionate weight to minority communities or territorially smaller territorial units with small populations. In some cases, this can be quite problematic. Uh, you will know, recall in, in Brazil, this is a real issue. The upper house is really does distort the Brazilian uh, political system uh, because it gives so much weight to the smaller provinces, to the smaller states, or the less populous states. Um, and you can also have non-majoritarian features in lower house. <coughs> Similarly, presidential elections, I mean, you, I mean, we saw it here in the United States, the way in which a president elected isn't simply majoritarian based on a vote. It goes through a rather complicated procedure invented 200 years ago and doesn't necessarily produce uh, a majoritarian result. Um, but Kenya and Nigeria have requirements for special majorities written in and so on and so forth. There, and, and, Less formally, you'll find political parties often have policies that uh, how they how they bring the, the two communities or the different communities together, and so on. So many the, the point of these examples is that many democracies show a high tolerance for non-majoritarian rules and practices. What distinguishes consociationalism, in my view, are two special features: the fact that joint decision making applies potentially to so many issues of day-to-day -day government. And the, the blocking minority the, the, is always the same. I mean, if, if, if you have a majority versus a minority, it's the two, the two are always rubbing up against one another. And these two features can create a dynamic of trying to minimize uh, the items that get subjected to joint decision making, uh, where some people try to either devolve to the territory or to, a functional, to functional mechanisms. Or were that not possible, there can be great frustration about blockage uh, and because of the inability to make decisions. And a footnote I think is worth making that the Bosnia Herzegovina is not a, was not designed as a completely um, consociational arrangement because there is a deus ex machina in that agreement, which is the high representative. And the way in which it, it has actually been operating. Uh, has been very frequently decisions are imposed because of the inability to make make joint decisions, and this is of course one of the issues that people are confronting in, in those terms. I mean, how do they get out of that trap of depending on sort of a Deus Ex Machina? When we when we look at consociational agreements, I would suggest that we we can distinguish two dimensions: those that come out of a conflict, a, a, a violent conflict. Um, and, and those that arise through incremental steps uh, in a peaceful democratic regime. That's one way of, one dimension. And the second dimension is those which are territorially divided versus those where they, sh where it's impossible to sort of structure the thing territorially and you share the same space. So 
uh, in the first case, you have federal, federal systems which have consociational dimension to them, and in the second case, unitary systems which have a consociational dimension. So Northern Ireland would be the latter. Um, Northern Ireland, Bosnia Herzegovina, and Burundi all, all came out of conflict, and so they merged more or less fully bone. I mean, as 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 uh, Marie Jo well explained, and. But what, but what we have seen in Bosnia-Herzegovina is the, the, uh, an attempt to minimize shared decision making. The, it, so you ended up with the central state, such as it is, uh, being a bit of a shell uh, with, with very limited powers. Uh, in Northern Ireland, that's, it has not been possible to devolve that much uh, away from central. So they're, they're had, they have been forced to do more joint decision making. But so I would suggest the core problem between the, the, core, the core problem be, com, comparing Bosnia and Herzegovina to Northern Ireland is that in the one case, the former case, it's trying to build a national state that has some substance, and in the other case, it's managing the need for so much joint management. Um, the attempt to find a consociational solution for for Cyprus has been stymied. Uh, in part because uh, the Greeks, who are 80% of the population, this issue of, of, of joint decision making. The consociational arrangements tend to be easier if the populations have a degree of parity in size. Um, and I, I'm not saying that you would necessarily solve the problem in Greece with the equal populations, but it might help. Uh, Belgium, and other, or, or, or finish with, with, with this, and we, the rest we can come to in the discussion. But Belgium saw the emergence of consociationism in quite a different way. I mean, the, for, for many years, it had a kind of consociational arrangement which was more religious than linguistic. And the political parties uh, tended to be either religious or secular and left-right. Um, but they sort of made a fateful decision in 1932 to divide the country linguistically, to have a, a hard line. And there are all kinds of uh, when we talk about identity politics, identity and stereotypes, there are, I mean, there are all kinds of issues why language has been such a sensitive issue in in Belgium. But that the decision to create that line, and then the the, the subsequent the politics around the the, the the idea was that the line would be revised from time to time. And the first revision proved extremely controversial. It came after World War II. Eventually, I mean, they suppressed the results of the census for a while. The, uh, the, uh, eventually, the majority imposed a decision which the, uh, the, the, the Dutch-speaking majority imposed a decision. And that, over time, led to the breakup of the party system and the realignment of the party system on linguistic lines. And it, 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 it's, there's sort of been a continuing dynamic of, of a system which is strictly divided linguistically. And uh, without the common attachment of Brussels, it's hard to see how, how uh, Belgium would survive. Uh, I mean, one of the interesting questions, and I don't have the expertise to answer it, but it could, could one have envisaged any other outcome in Belgium? And then were there points where it could have, it could have gone another way? Um, and I, perhaps in you know, the, dis the discussion I could speak a little bit about the contrast with Switzerland, uh, which has managed to realign boundaries without, without it becoming a traumatic event uh, as between uh, the parts of the country. Thank you. Uh, so thank you to our panelists. And so